Chapter Twenty Three of the Lair of the White Worm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lair of the White Worm by Bram Stoker. Chapter Twenty Three, In the Enemy's House. Sir Nathaniel was in the library next morning after breakfast when Adam came to him carrying a letter. Her ladyship doesn't lose any time. She has begun work already. Sir Nathaniel, who was writing at a table near the window, looked up. "'What is it?' he said. Adam held out the letter he was carrying. It was in a blazoned envelope. "'Ha!' Huh, said Sir Nathaniel, from the white worm. "'I expected something of the kind.' "'But,' said Adam, "'how could she have known we were here? She didn't know last night.' "'I don't think we need trouble ourselves about that, Adam. There is so much we do not understand. This is only another mystery. Suffice it that she does know.' Perhaps it is all the better and safer for us. How is that? asked Adam with a puzzled look. General process of reasoning, my boy, and the experience of some years in the diplomatic world. This creature is a monster without heart or consideration for anything or any one. She is not nearly so dangerous in the open as when she has the dark to protect her. Besides, we know by our own experience of her movements that for some reason she shuns publicity. In spite of her vast bulk and abnormal strength, she is afraid to attack openly. After all, she is only a snake, and with a snake's nature, which is to keep low and squirm, and proceed by stealth and cunning. She will never attack when she can run away, although she knows well that running away would probably be fatal to her. What is the letter about? Sir Nathaniel's voice was calm and self-possessed. When he was engaged in any struggle of wits, he was all diplomatist. She asks Mimi and me to tea this afternoon at Diana's Grove, and hopes that you also will favour her. Sir Nathaniel smiled. Please ask Mrs. Sultan to accept for us all. She means some deadly mischief. Surely, surely it would be wiser not. It's an old trick that we learn early in diplomacy, Adam, to fight on ground of your own choice. It is true that she suggested a place on this occasion, but by accepting it we make it ours. Moreover, she will not be able to understand our reason for doing so, and her own bad conscience, if she has any, bad or good, and her own fears and doubts will play our game for us. No, my dear boy, let us accept by all means. Adam said nothing, but silently held out his hand, which his companion shook. No words were necessary. When it was getting near tea-time, Mimi asked Sir Nathaniel how they were going. We must make a point of going in state. We want all possible publicity. Mimi looked at him inquiringly. Certainly, my dear, in the present circumstances publicity is a part of safety. Do not be surprised if, whilst we are at Diana's Grove, occasional messages come for you, for all or any of us. I see, said Mrs. Sultan. You are taking no chances. None, my dear. All I have learned in foreign courts and amongst civilized and uncivilized people is going to be utilized within the next couple of hours. Sir Nathaniel's voice was full of seriousness, and it brought to Mimi in a convincing way the awful gravity of the occasion. In due course they set out in a carriage drawn by a fine pair of horses, who soon devoured the few miles of their journey. Before they came to the gate, Sir Nathaniel turned to Mimi. I have arranged with Adam certain signals which may be necessary if certain eventualities occur. These need be nothing to do with you directly. But bear in mind that if I ask you or Adam to do anything, do not lose a second in the doing of it. We must try to pass off such moments with an appearance of unconcern. In all probability nothing requiring such care will occur. The white worm will not try force, though she has so much of it to spare. Whatever she may attempt today, of harm to any of us, will be in the way of secret plot. Some other time she may try force, but if I am able to judge such a thing, not today. The messengers who may ask for any of us will not be witnesses only. They may help to stave off danger. Seeing query in her face, he went on. Of what kind the danger may be, I know not, and cannot guess. It will doubtless be some ordinary circumstance, but none the less dangerous on that account. Here we are at the gate. Now, be careful in all matters, however small, to keep your head is half the battle. There were a number of men in livery in the hall when they arrived. The doors of the drawing-room were thrown open, and Lady Arabella came forth and offered them cordial welcome. 
This having been got over, Lady Arabella led them into another room where tea was served. Adam was acutely watchful and suspicious of everything, and saw on the far side of this room a panelled iron door of the same colour and configuration as the outer door of the room where was the well-hole wherein Ulanga had disappeared. Something in the sight alarmed him, and he quietly stood near the door. He made no movement, even of his eyes, but he could see that Sir Nathaniel was watching him intently, and, he fancied, with approval. They all sat near the table spread for tea, Adam still near the door. Lady Arabella fanned herself, complaining of heat, and told one of the footmen to throw all the outer doors open. Tea was in progress when Mimi suddenly started up with a look of fright on her face. At the same moment the men became cognizant of a thick smoke which began to spread through the room, a smoke which made those who experienced it gasp and choke. The footman began to edge uneasily toward the inner door. Denser and denser grew the smoke, and more acrid its smell. Mimi, towards whom the draught from the open door wafted the smoke, rose up choking, and ran to the inner door which he threw open to its fullest extent, disclosing on the outside a curtain of thin silk fixed to the door-posts. The draught from the open door swayed the thin silk towards her, and in her fright she tore down the curtain, which enveloped her from head to foot. Then she ran through the still open door, heedless of the fact that she could not see where she was going. Adam, followed by Sir Nathaniel, rushed forward and joined her, Adam catching his wife by the arm and holding her tight. It was well that he did so, for just before her lay the black orifice of the well-hole, which, of course, she could not see with the silk curtain round her head. The floor was extremely slippery, something like thick oil had been spilled where she had to pass, and close to the edge of the hole her feet shot from under her, and she stumbled forward towards the well-hole. When Adam saw Mimi slip, he flung himself backwards, still holding her. His weight told, and he dragged her up from the hole, and they fell together on the floor outside the zone of slipperiness. In a moment he had raised her up, and together they rushed out through the open door into the sunlight, Sir Nathaniel close behind them. They were all pale except the old diplomatist, who looked both calm and cool. It sustained and cheered Adam and his wife to see him thus master of himself. Both managed to follow his example, to the wonderment of the footman, who saw the three who had just escaped a terrible danger walking together gaily, as, under the guiding pressure of Sir Nathaniel's hand, they turned to re-enter the house. Lady Arabella, whose face had blanched to a deadly white, now resumed her ministrations at the tea-board as though nothing unusual had happened. The slop-basin was full of half-burned brown paper, over which tea had been poured. Sir Nathaniel had been narrowly observing his hostess, and took the first opportunity afforded to him of whispering to Adam. "'The real attack is to come. She is too quiet. When I give my hand to your wife to lead her out, come with us, and caution her to hurry.' Don't lose a second, even if you have to make a scene. Hush. Then they resumed their places close to the table, and the servants, in obedience to Lady Arabella's order, brought in fresh tea. Thence on, that tea party seemed to Adam, whose faculties were at their utmost intensity, like a terrible dream. As for poor Mimi, she was so overwrought both with present and future fear, and with the horror at the danger she had escaped, that her faculties were numb. However, she was braced up for a trial, and she felt assured that whatever might come she would be able to go through with it. Sir Nathaniel seemed just as usual, suave, dignified, and thoughtful, perfect master of himself. To her husband it was evident that Mimi was ill at ease. The way she kept turning her head to look around her, the quick coming and going of the colour of her face, her hurried breathing, alternating with periods of suspicious calm, were evidences of mental perturbation. To her, the attitude of Lady Arabella seemed compounded of social sweetness and personal consideration. It would be hard to imagine more thoughtful and tender kindness towards an honoured guest. When tea was over, and the servants had come to clear away the cups, Lady Arabella, putting her arm around Mimi's waist, strolled with her into an adjoining room, where she collected a number of photographs which were scattered about, and, sitting down beside her guest, began to show them to her. While she was doing this, the servants closed all the doors of the suite of rooms, as well as that which opened from the room outside, that of the well-hole into the avenue. Suddenly, without any seeming cause, the light in the room began to grow dim. Sir Nathaniel, who was sitting close to Mimi, rose to his feet, and crying, "'Quick!' 
caught hold of her hand and began to drag her from the room. Adam caught her other hand, and between them they drew her through the outer door which the servants were beginning to close. It was difficult at first to find the way, the darkness was so great, but to their relief when Adam whistled shrilly, the carriage and horses which had been waiting in the angle of the avenue dashed up. Her husband and Sir Nathaniel lifted, almost threw, Mimi into the carriage. The postillion plied whip and spur, and the vehicle rocking with its speed swept through the gate and tore up the road. Behind them was a hubbub, servants rushing about, orders being shouted, doors shutting, and somewhere, seemingly far back in the house, a strange noise. Every nerve of the horses was strained as they dashed recklessly along the road. The two men held Mimi between them, the arms of both of them round her as though protectingly. As they went, there was a sudden rise in the ground, but the horses, breathing heavily, dashed up it at racing speed, not slackening their pace when the hill fell away again, leaving them to hurry along the downgrade. It would be foolish to say that neither Adam nor Mimi had any fear in returning to Doom Tower. Mimi felt it more keenly than her husband, whose nerves were harder, and who was more inert at danger. Still she bore up bravely, and as usual the effort was helpful to her. When once she was in the study in the top of the turret, she almost forgot the terrors which lay outside in the dark. She did not attempt to peep out of the window, but Adam did, and saw nothing. The moonlight showed all the surrounding country, but nowhere was to be observed the tremulous line of green light. The peaceful night had a good effect on them all. Danger, being unseen, seemed far off. At times it was hard to realise that it had ever been. With courage restored, Adam rose early and walked along the brow, seeing no change in the signs of life in Castra Regis. What he did see, to his wonder and concern, on his returning homeward, was Lady Arabella, in her tight-fitting white dress and ermine collar, but without her emeralds. She was emerging from the gate of Diana's Grove and walking towards the castle. Pondering on this and trying to find some meaning in it occupied his thoughts till he joined Mimi and Sir Nathaniel at breakfast. They began the meal in silence. What had been had been, and was known to them all. Moreover, it was not a pleasant topic. A fillip was given to the conversation when Adam told of his seeing Lady Arabella on her way to Castra Regis. They each had something to say of her, and of what her wishes or intentions were towards Edgar Caswell. Mimi spoke bitterly of her in every aspect. She had not forgotten, and never would, never could, the occasion when, to harm Lilla, the woman had consorted even with the nigger. As a social matter, she was disgusted with her for following up the rich landowner. Throwing herself at his head so shamelessly was how she expressed it. She was interested to know that the great kite still flew from Caswell's tower. But beyond such matters she did not try to go. The only comment she made was of strongly expressed surprise at her ladyship's cheek in ignoring her own criminal acts, and her impudence in taking it for granted that others had overlooked them also. End of chapter 23 Recording by Richard Skipper, Melbourne, Australia